Yeah. Well, let me show you something. Hold on. Mm -hmm. Step back to your original mark. So one, one thousand, two, one thousand, three. I'm getting up. Right. Uh -huh. Then when he drops his arm, Helena, get out. He drops his arm. That means Brady's close. I'm gonna start to really get up. I got nightmares in my head. I feel thoughts build up until I can't feel. My mind fills up into a creature, and it haunts me somewhere much deeper. I got nightmares in my head. I feel. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. Some of you may know that I did a recent analysis on Matthew Perry where I asked the rhetorical question, am I my brother's keeper? And I couldn't help thinking about that while also watching the Netflix series on Lacey Peterson. You know, who was Lacey's keeper? You know, did Amber Fry think about that? You know, am I my sister's keeper? And that does appear to be Alec Baldwin's defense on the set of Rust. Do I owe anyone anything on a movie set? I'm just an actor. Well, I suppose one could add, do I owe anyone anything on a movie set? I'm just a producer. Am I my brother's keeper? It's not my job. Maybe it's somebody else's job. What's interesting from a legal as well as a moral perspective is another figure in the story, Joel Souza, the director, the man standing behind Alina in that chapel when the firearm went off. Now, thanks to his cinematographer bearing the brunt of a bullet that tore sideways through her body, the director's life was essentially saved. But did he owe her anything? Am I my sister's keeper? In a real sense, the director was almost standing in the shoes of the cinematographer who died, except he wasn't. And she died, and he lived to tell the tale. But did he tell the tale? Has he told the tale? The strange thing for a storyteller and filmmaker is Sousa's studied silence regarding this case. Quoting from Vanity Fair, The filmmaker has stayed silent publicly ever since. Part of what kept him silent was abject grief. Really? He's been grieving for two, three years. Has he been grieving for Alina? Has he been grieving for himself? Or has he been grieving for the production that got put on hold for a while? According to the article, Sousa also refused to speak publicly about the shooting out of deference to the criminal cases that resulted. Ah, that's more like it. As you're about to find out, he gave his exclusive to Vanity Fair the day after Alec Baldwin's trial ended. That's pretty quick moving. From his home in Northern California. The conversation with Vanity Fair, I'll put a link to that article in the description, went on for almost four hours. Before we get to that, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. I don't know about you, but I feel like we have unfinished business when it comes to this particular case. And Vanity Fair's uh, reporting sort of addresses some of that. If you find this analysis worthwhile, please like, share, leave a comment. You can also hit the thanks button and let's get started. So scrolling through the article, it's a really long article. There's a section titled The Fatal Day. And the reporter says, on the day of the accident, your camera crew walked out over a dispute with the producers over housing accommodations. There's also about safety. They wanted to be put up at a hotel closer to the set, not in Albuquerque, in Santa Fe. As a result, there were delays the morning of the shooting as a replacement camera operators were brought in. Do you think that was a distraction that contributed to the accident? And this is Sousa's response. No, it had nothing to do with it. In that downtime, there was plenty of time for people to be doing things they needed to do. There was plenty of time for the armorer who he seems to be blaming here, to be checking through ammunition, to be loading the weapons. There was no rush that morning. That day, the pace was downright languid because we had one camera. I'm like, forget this. We are not rushing today. What we finish, we finish because the day was screwed anyway. Now, I'm sorry if you know the Rush narrative, you know it's almost a bad joke that the movie should have been called Rush because that was the vibe on set for much, if not most, of the time. It's incredible that in his first answers regarding the day of the incident, he repeats twice, there was plenty of time, there was plenty of time, then he adds that there was no rush, and then he reinforces this with, the pace was downright languid. 
But I think he puts his foot in it when he says, forget this, we are not rushing today. Because we have seen footage where Baldwin is rushing his crew. One more, one more, one more. I forgot to recall stuff. No, no, right away, right away, let's reload. Here we go. In some of this footage, and I showed some of it right at the beginning of this analysis of this video, we also see on camera Baldwin motioning, directing the crew with his revolver. That's a no-no. On the stand, during the trial and conviction of Russ Armourer, Hannah Guterres Reed, I would say that Sousa was, this is just my opinion, he was in the top three of, for me, the most disappointing witnesses on the stand. He really didn't have, seem to have much to say. Am I my brother's keeper? Well, is he Helena's keeper? Again, is he looking out for her? Is he Baldwin's keeper? Is he looking out for him? Is he his sister's keeper, his brother's keeper, or just his own keeper? Is he, or is he just looking out for himself? I'm sorry, I just don't accept, you know, you know, without your original crew and with just one camera, that that's not going to have a major impact on a lot of things. Anyway, going back to the article... A very simple, open-ended question. How was it going? He answers, there was a little disagreement about the approach. Again, just character stuff like, why doesn't my character stand there? I was trying to explain, please, just today, of all days, just do what I'm telling you. And so he's asked, so the disagreement was between you and Alec, not you and Alina. And so Sousa answers, yeah, me and Alec. Again, this was just a little piece and we were going to have Another little piece after that. Alina had an idea for it angle-wise, and I'm like, well, audition it for me. Let's take a look. So they start setting all that up. We were in the middle of this aisle between pews, and there's Alec and all these people. I'm bumping into 25 people. I'm in the way completely. There's always This is always the case when you're setting up a shot. He's the only character at that point, but there's grips and a lot of people. Wardrobes in and out, makeup. I decided to get out of the way and I went outside. So that's news. The director and Alec were disagreeing and what he said, please, just today, do as I'm telling you. That's not any suggestion that there was, um, that sweet Mr. Baldwin might sometimes be tough to work with. And then did he? Did he do as he was told? I mean, didn't this incident happen because someone did something without being told to do it? Didn't this incident happen because someone did something impulsively that wasn't in the script? Think of those words, just today, please do as I'm telling you. Anyway, he says he went outside, not because the church was small, and yet he says there were tight spaces. I don't know, for me, the church does look quite small. Amazingly, when Baldwin's defense presented their opening argument, that made it seem like no one was in the church besides Alex, some actors at the door and the camera woman. And of course, yeah, you have the directors making a totally different case that the church was packed, that there were over 20 people in that one small building. Going back to the article, uh, is asked, when did you understand what happened? And then he, he doesn't answer that really. He says, it's so disorienting. My ears were ringing. Your vision kind of does this, right? It's suddenly like you looking through a camera and you're seeing people running around. There's panic. Now, Really, was that, his, what, was that his experience? He's shot and he's seeing things in camera angles. I really don't think so. He says, my initial thought was that I was very angry. I was furious. And then he also says that he saw them lowering Helena to sit in front of him and there was blood coming through a white shirt. Oh, he didn't know right away what had happened. Think about what's going on. There's a, a loud noise, a bang such as from a, from a gun, a muzzle flash, the smell of smoke, the sight of smoke, the sight of blood. He's just been shot, but he doesn't know that he's just been shot. He sees blood, and his first thought isn't that he just got shot with a gun immediately following the sound of a gun. This is why I find his version of events so annoying. Sousa seems very angry, but angry about his own predicament. He doesn't seem to include Helena in that, and his anger doesn't really seem to be directed at anyone. For a director, that's kind of ironic, wouldn't you say? Now, I'm not going to take it any further than that. If you want me to continue the analysis of this article, please let me know in the comments. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you guys next time. <laughs>